The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Welcome uh, to iOS application development. Uh, my name is Jan Borches. Um, I'm teaching this class together uh, with a couple of folks from our lab. Uh, this is the first class this semester, and um, as I mentioned um, earlier, we would love for you folks to uh, please wear a mask, if you don't mind, um, for the concern of yourself and uh, your fellow students and also our teaching staff. Thank you. If you do need a mask, we have a few extras down here uh, that you can pick up. Now, um, this class, if you only remember one thing of this class, then it's the jump page that we have down there. This is our chair's homepage, hci.etc slash iOS, okay? Under this URL, you'll find all the information you need for this class, and this is not behind a registration wall or anything like that. Anybody can, can see this uh, page. Now, who's teaching the class? Um, that would be myself, uh, giving some of the lectures, but then also uh, some of the lectures and some of the labs will be done uh, by our two teaching assistants and PhD students, um, Rene, walking down the stairs right over there, and Oli, right there next to the recording equipment. Now, um, if you do have any um, questions about the class, if you have trouble um, signing up, uh, the first place usually to go to is to post something on the forums, because the big advantage of that, of course, is that everybody will be able to uh, see this, and not just you and uh, uh, and us, but if you have a very personal concern that you're worried you don't want to share with anybody else, then feel free to email these two folks, Renee and Oliver, um, and they will be happy to help you out. Um, it's usually fairly low success rate to email me because I do get a ton of email and I'm probably not going to be able to get back to you as quickly as these two folks can. But if there are any concerns that you can't work out with Renee and Oli, I don't think there are, but if there are, then of course, feel free to reach out to me. Now, uh, this class has a bit of an unusual structure that I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to tell you what you're going to take away from this class. Uh, of course, it's about iOS development. So, of course, we'll be talking about how to write applications for the iOS sort of universe. But uh, we're going to start, actually, today with um, a few general remarks on how developing for mobile is fundamentally different from developing for uh, desktop environments or, or the web in general. Then we will um, jump into how to write iOS apps. This will include discussions on um, how you do this with the toolkit that has been around um, since the iPhone launched in 2007, uh, which would be iOS, uh, a UI kit. But we will also talk about sort of the new kid on the block that was released just a couple years ago, which is Swift UI. These two frameworks and, and environments uh, also represent two modern but fundamentally different uh, approaches to actually um, building user interfaces and interactive applications. So it's a good exercise um, to get acquainted with both of these, at least briefly, so that you can see how you can build apps in different ways. After we do this, uh, we will um, dive into the you know, more advanced iOS frameworks um, that we will cover. And uh, the, this is sort of the second part of the class. And then the third part of this class is going to be a project in which you get to you know, pick your favorite um, environments and, uh, and frameworks and really dive deep into building an app that uses these and, and show us that you've mastered iOS. We're a lab that, that focuses on, on um, HCI, on, on human-computer interaction, on usability, and on good user interfaces. So that will always, always be a little bit of a twist um, on how we share things with you. So we'll always talk about how to build the best possible user experience uh, with the frameworks and technologies that we provide you. Uh, this is also a class where you will be you know, doing quite a lot of coding. So be ready to um, have a swift rundown, uh, no pun intended, of um, a few programming language environments and a few programming techniques, which we expect you then to pick up. 
Um, the class will uh, feature iOS throughout, and um, I figured maybe I'd show you a couple examples of what our lab has been doing with this. Because frankly, um, ever since we were, you were able to program with iOS, um, which was, I think, when you were able to write your own apps was around 2009, 2008, something like that. Um, we've been doing this here at the lab too. I think uh, a day after Apple shared their documentation in, on how to build apps with the SDK, um, we had a student at our lab who's, who showed us you know, what he had been able to do with this. Um, and for us in, at, the, at our lab, the uh, iOS environment is sort of both the, uh, something that we teach in this class, but also something we use for our research prototypes so, um, and our projects. So I'll show you a couple examples of what we've been doing with iOS. Some of these things you can actually try out. Um, there is, for example, um, the um, flap, this is the, the top left one here. This is a, uh, called the Future Lab Aachen app. I know you'll all have this problem at some point. Your parents are visiting, you know, and they come and they're like, so what are we gonna do in Aachen? So you can download this application that we wrote for the city of Aachen a few years ago, uh, and that is being kept updated, uh, which is a little tour of the inner city of Aachen, but with a twist to it, it talks about the science happening in the city. Like, you know, you go to the, the cathedral and it'll tell you that, you know, a colleague of ours, um, has actually 3D scanned the cathedral, stuff like this. It uses augmented reality, so that's an interesting twist on, the, on, the, on this um, application called Future Lab Aachen App, or FLAP for short. Um, we also have built um, applications for um, other sort of museums and, and guide environments. For example, if you've been to the uh, Centre Charlemagne, which is on the Katschhof between the town hall and the cathedral, um, then you can take a tour there of the environment. And that's, again, something that we've built um, as a um, sort of professional app that you can download um, in the App Store, in the iOS App Store. And uh, again, this one started out with, uh, with some interesting features around being able to actually do indoor location tracking of a user and figure out where they are and offer them the best experience possible. And uh, lastly, um, here is an application that we built um, quite a few years ago uh, for the uh, Aachen Town Hall. This is an application that actually lets you uh, go up into the Coronation Hall, the upper chamber in the Town Hall, and experience a medieval feast there that's happening, like a Coronation Feast from the 1500s. But you don't see anything, you just hear it. So everything is just audio augmented reality, we called it. Um, and this was the first system of its kind in the world that gave you an audio experience that you could have while you are in a physical space by walking around, turning your head this way or that way, uh, these audio sources were actually um, getting closer or farther away. Uh, it almost felt like, you know, let's say the, the, the king that was just being um, coronated there was actually in the room and you could walk up to him or walk away from him. A little bit of an unfortunate name for that project, but hey, it was 2009 or something, we called it Corona. Um, and the last one here I want to mention on this, on this side is um, iEat, which is a little app for the uh, iPhone and the Apple Watch to actually um, take a look at today's Mensa menus um, here at the university. So that might be something you find useful too. Um, so this, these are all examples of, of tools we've built that are, you know, uh, that have been available on the App Store or are available on the App Store and that people can use. Uh, but there's also the, the research side of things. So uh, uh, we've built, for example, um, the force picker, which is a, a little bit of an, a, a test application that um, tries a new way of, of selecting data. Um, you know, when you, when you spin these wheels to pick a number, it's kind of annoying sometimes until you get to the right number, right? And so for a while, Apple was building uh, pretty good force touch features into their, um, into their iPhones, and so we used that, and so by, by pressing harder or less hard, you could actually adjust the number and it saved a lot of screen real estate on, on the screen for an app uh, while being quite easy to adjust to. So this is a research project that we published and the research prototype we built on iOS simply because we know really well how to write um, these kinds of programs for that and so it's our natural uh, choice to do this. AR Pen is something you can actually download in the App Store too. It's uh, an app that lets you draw an augmented reality with your iPhone. So you hold your iPhone in one hand, you have a little bit of a cardboard printout with a QR code on it that you can print yourself from the app. 
Um, and when you doodle with this in a 3D space, the uh, smartphone actually tracks your movement and you can design 3D objects uh, by doing this. This was part of a research project that we did into um, creating new ways to let people build 3D models um, rather than having to learn AutoCAD, you know. Uh, this was something that let you just sketch something in the air. And you can send the thing that you draw uh, there to your 3D printer if you like. Um, and Explorer, another example of a very early um, indoor location tracking um, guide system that we actually um, built. So, uh, what I'm trying to show you with this is that there is um, a reasonable amount of expertise that we have in building apps that actually hit you know, the App Store and that we uh, keep uh, running, that we maintain, uh, and that we have to continuously update to work with the latest technologies and, and uh, iPhones, of course. Now, a couple administrative details. Uh, first of all, this is a six credit class, as you know, um, and class times are Mondays from 12.30 to 2, uh, and Tuesdays from 10.30 to 12, right? Um, we're here today because we had a uh, very large number of um, registrations, and so we weren't sure how many of those registrations would actually show up here, so that's why we picked this room for today, but we will be able to move back to the seminar room once we've determined the actual class size. We only have 42 seats for this class available. And if I do a quick look around here right now, uh, we may be able to get you all in, I think. Um, the reason for the uh, registration number limitations is simply that um, the classes are fairly intense in coaching people how to build their projects. We look at your projects that you're building. We have a seminar part of this class. So all of this is a lot of um, you know, personal consultation uh, with us. And that does, just doesn't scale well to a very large scale, uh, to a very large class. But on the other hand, it's a uh, very um, you know, intense class for you guys where you will have a lot of chances to get feedback from us. So. Uh, these, both these slots are our class times, and um, what's a little weird is maybe that in the beginning, we will front load this class with a couple lecture segments where we will be just giving you a lot of material to, um, you know, to process and to get you up to speed on Swift and uh, iOS basics as quickly as possible. And then it will move into a seminar style uh, class in the second half or the second third of the semester where you will be talking yourself about particular topics um, out of the iOS framework world. And then there's a third part of this class where you will be working on your project and deliver that as in a final presentation. All right, what do you need for this class? Um, obviously, we're not gonna explain object orientation to you, right? Um, you've all learned this in your classes already. Um, so that's something that we assume is given. Uh, you'll also need an Apple developer ID, but that just means you know, signing up for one um, online. That's easy enough. Um, you also have to register for this class in RWH online. Um, and uh, you, in order to program uh, iOS apps, you need a Mac. Uh, now, if you do not have a Mac, uh, we have a very limited number of machines that we can make available to you folks on a timeshare basis. Uh, we have set up a few machines, I think five, right, Oli? Five in uh, a room in the, uh, what is it, e E2 building, I think? Yeah, uh, E2 building. Um, there is a, there's a special lab room that we have equipped. We've bought new uh, M1 Mac minis there and put them in there um, that you know, we will make available to you folks if you need uh, to do that. Uh, but that means that you will have to share these machines with anybody else who may not have access to a Mac. So this shouldn't be something that keeps you from doing this class, but if you do have your own machine that can run Mac OS, uh, you'll be um, a bit happier because then you can work on your assignments you know, whenever, you, whenever you like. And you're not limited to the access times of uh, the lab machines there. Um, Optional, but, but helpful, is having an iOS uh, device, you know, an iPhone, an iPad, um, that can run the latest version of iOS. Um, I'm saying optional because uh, pretty much everything you'll be doing, you can try out in the simulator. 
the simulator is a pretty good environment um, in, in Xcode, the environment that you're going to be developing with. And uh, so there are some things, of course, you know, if you want to shake your phone around and you're doing something with your accelerometer, uh, then that's something that's just more um, realistic to do on a real device. But for most things, you'll be fine with the simulator, especially in the beginning. Um, that's not a problem at all. Um, and again here, we do have a few timeshare devices that we can give out if people do not have an iOS device and need one um, for their stuff. Now, what's also optional but helpful is you, if you already have experience with Swift or Objective-C, the previous language that uh, iOS development was happening in, uh, then that's great, but not a requirement. We will start with Swift from scratch, but we'll go through it at, you know, faster than what we did maybe with Java with you folks in like the first year. Um, and uh, this class is for students who are in uh, computer science, bachelor's, master's, um, and SSE, media informatics, data science, or technical communication. Uh, I would love to actually get a quick show of hands and maybe, Brene, you can take a look and, and make very rough notes of how many people we have just to get a feel for who is actually here. Um, let's start with Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Can you raise your hand? All right, that's, I would say, about 20, maybe? Okay, 25. Uh, then we have Master of Science in Computer Science. All right, that's about 10, I'd say. Um, then we have uh, Master of Science in SSE, Software Systems Engineering. Uh, one, two. Uh, we have Master of Science in Media Informatics. One, um, Data Science. Uh, nobody? Uh, and Technical Communication, also one. Okay, good, thank you. Um, any questions on, yeah, go ahead. Ah, oh, yes, of course, forget you guys. All right, computational social systems, thank you very much. Anybody else from, from uh, CSS? Uh, one, two, okay, I think that's it. All right, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Anybody else that I forgot to mention? Any other majors you have, any other programs you're studying? It's fine, you can speak up, no? All right, good. Um, okay, so uh, the the other thing we should point out is, as you know, as we go into the uh, the seminar part of the class, some of the seminar topics uh, you may actually need uh, an iOS device for. Right? So that's something maybe to keep in mind as you pick your topic later on. Um, um, that you know you may have to need to use a device for some of these. Okay, so I, I mentioned that the class has a weird structure, and it does indeed. So we're going to start with these lectures uh, introducing Swift and iOS. Um, and then in the second part, we will talk about um, iOS frameworks. But we won't be doing all the talking here. You will actually go in and dive deep on um, a framework of your choice. Um, and then you'll talk to everybody else about that seminar style, right? as you know it from, from seminars. Um, and this gives you a chance to both get really acquainted with the one that you pick yourself, but also hear about all the others in, in the seminar format so that you have a rough idea of what's out there. Um, and the third part is then the project application development that happens in the last third of the class. Uh, correspondingly, uh, your grade also uh, consists of these three parts, right? Uh, we will grade you uh, of course, there's going to be a final exam right at the end of the class, uh, but it's not the only thing you need to do uh, for your grade. If you look at it this way, if you do your seminar, um, that will contribute to 20% of your grade. Um, the project that you're going to be doing is going to be the largest part. Um, that's 50% of your grade. And then if you, the day you walk into the final exam, you actually have 70% of your grade already in your pocket. Right? So that's um, our way of trying to encourage you and also to, to reward you for continuing to stay with the class throughout the semester, rather than you know, partying all semester and then trying to learn everything in the 72 hours before the exam. We all know that's not healthy and not very sustainable in terms of remembering what you actually learned. So we want you guys to be with us all semester round, and if you do that, this is actually the advantage you get from that. All right, what are we gonna talk about in the uh, in the lectures first. There is going to be an introduction to Swift, the programming language. Um, 
it's not going to be you know groundbreakingly different uh, from other languages that you may that you know I'm assuming um, anybody here who doesn't know Java just as a quick check okay so I think that's that's good um, so it's not going to be groundbreakingly different but there are some things that are that are different we're going to point those out as we go um, and but we're not going to you know spend a class on what is an if statement, right? <laughs> um, then we will go into, uh, of course, at the same time, teach you guys how Xcode works and how you use that environment, because, of course, there are some things that, um, you know, are just easiest picked up if somebody shows you the ropes of, of the tool. And then we will get into uh, UI kit, which is the toolkit you use, the, you know, the frameworks uh, environment that you use to build interactive applications on iOS. And then we will look at a couple particular topics like navigating, navigation, meaning you know, navigating between screens, right, on on an uh, in an app, or how we animate things like animating changes, transitions, um, how we customize things from the default look that you get when you create a user interface, um, how collections work, how auto layout works, so where it helps you um, to actually you know have to do less work getting the UI lined up the way that it, you you want it to. Um, Persistence, networking are, are topics that we will talk about, like how do you get persistent storage for applications between uh, launches if you need to store some data, and you know everybody does in some way. And of course, how you talk to the, uh, to the internet. Uh, we'll also talk about bindings, uh, which is a nice way of, of, of you know, redu again, reducing the work that you need to do to tie your code to the user interface design that you're creating. And then of course we will, uh, do this with UIKit first, uh, but we will also talk about Swift UI towards the end of this class. This is each year for us a different, difficult decision to make because Swift UI has been introduced a few years ago now, um, uh, and it's becoming a, a very promising environment to build applications around. And for some, you know, very simple applications and, and, and standard use cases, it's actually a super quick way to build stuff and a very fun way to do that. Um, we will show you that for sure. There are a lot of things once you get down into you know the nitty gritty and the the the, the details of actually building a full blown application that goes out on the App Store, where you will often fall back to using UIKit because it's just an extremely mature and and robust framework that's been around uh, for yeah, 15 years now. Right? So it's it's new enough not to have you know, the old uh, freight, like, you know, I don't know, writing code in COBOL or something. Um, but it is, uh, has been around long enough with these device class in mind that, you know, most things have been worked out very smoothly. So that's why we do stick with UIKit here for a while, but we'll also show you the different way of doing it. Both of these work with the same programming language, right? You're always coding in Swift. It's just that the toolkit you use, like the UI toolkit that you use, is going to be different. Now, there's something else that I want to definitely make you guys aware of, um, because this is a very useful resource. Um, Apple's actually released free eBooks on their uh, iBook store um, that are called Develop in Swift Fundamentals and Develop in Swift Data Collections. And we are structuring this class as far as possible and as far as it makes sense for this code um, to follow this textbook. But the textbook is more like a high school, college level kind of text. So there you will get, you know, a long explanation of what an if statement is. And um, we were at some meetings where, where Apple talks, you know, to its, its educational institutions that teach iOS. Uh, and they say, yeah, and this is, you know, for the first quarter, this is what we do in this. And we're like, well, you know, with our average house students, we kind of do that in the first class because you guys know this stuff, right? We're not gonna bore you with these details. So we're gonna go very fast paced to, through the basics that are in this book. Um, and so while you will find the general structure in there, uh, we're gonna give you uh, the things that we think you need to know and that should be enough to pick up the language here in a very compact and fast uh, forward uh, format. But what that means is if you, there is something you just can't wrap your head around from what we share here with you, by all means, go into these books and, and read it up, right? This is a, I don't think you can get lost in these books. It's just, you know, it's 
long to read for each of these things. There's lots of examples in there. They take very small steps. So it, you know, nobody can get lost. It just takes the time to process. So you've got these two approaches, right? You can take it from here from the class where we do it in a sort of probably more of a master's than maybe a bachelor's level, but for sure a computer science student's uh, uh, level who know uh, the basics of, of object-oriented programming and are just picking up another language and toolkit. Um, and if there's something that you have or have trouble with, then you can go and check out the, uh, the textbook uh, and the corresponding parts in there. So that's going to be the first part of the class. And then we move into this uh, second mode, uh, the seminar, right? So the seminar will have um, a whole bunch of topics. And here are some examples of what uh, you might end up uh, with as a, um, as a seminar topic. Um, you know, core animation, um, or haptics, sound, sprite kit, working with files, the combined framework, which is interesting, um, that you may have actually heard about, uh, how debugging works in Xcode, always fun, um, using Siri and Widget Kit, uh, widgets are a very new addition to the iOS uh, user experience, um, or the, the web view that's available, um, but also things like MapKit, you know, anything people need to navigate or, or find their bearing on a, on a map uh, makes use of that. Um, how you use presentation controllers. And then there is actually uh, machine learning uh, parts in there. Everybody's like, ooh, machine learning, right? Uh, so there are uh, frameworks that let you do simple machine learning models and, and, and work with these. Uh, but also for persistent storage, um, core data is a very powerful environment that takes care of storing data for you, giving you free undo, redo features, stuff like this. You don't need to program them yourself. Uh, we'll also talk about some other form factors, like the watch, for example. How do you write apps for watch OS as opposed to iOS? Um, scene kit, you know, there are a variety of 2D and 3D rendering environments that, that we'll talk about that are interesting. Um, We'll also have uh, something that particularly looks at how you do Swift UI um, at an advanced level. So you know, the, the, the latest toolkit from Apple, the, the alternative to UI kit. And of course, if you want to really get down and dirty, then you can also look at Metal, which is sort of the, you know, you could maybe compare it to some, something like DirectX on the Windows world, um, you know, really getting down to 3D graphics and, and high performance rendering stuff. Now, um, how will this work? Uh, once we're done with our, our uh, front-loading lectures here in the first couple of weeks, uh, you will be giving these 15-minute presentations. Uh, this will be happening you know, late November through uh, mid-December. And what we expect from you is that you give everybody an overview of the framework, right? We're all here to learn about these frameworks together. So remember, your fellow students will also depend on your performance to understand what's going on there. Uh, we expect some example apps that you that you build and that you explain. Um, and this is something you should be aware of. You need to be there for this, right? Because this is like a seminar. And as you all know, seminars usually have mandatory attendance. Right? So um, make sure if you do sign up for this class, if you remain signed up for this class, that you keep that time slot open. Right? You don't uh, disappear to a different class or, or some other activity during that time. Um, and as we said, this will make up 20% of your final grade. If you don't object, uh, then we will record these talks, um, and this can help both you to you know, review it later and see how you did um, to learn a bit about your presentation style, but also help others to review these materials um, as we get towards you know, the final exam. Now, how does the third part of the class work? This is a project that kicks off just uh, when the seminar talks have wrapped up. So we'll give you um, a project kickoff um, late December before the Christmas break. So you can kind of mull over what you might want to do um, you know, while you're sitting under the Christmas tree. Um, and we'll give you the topics when we get to the, the kickoff date there. Um, what you will be building there is a, uh, an app that could be submitted to the App Store. Right? And that's the goal of the project. Now you're gonna, you, you won't be actually submitting it to the App Store, you'll be submitting it to us. Um, but the rules are the same um, for this. The final presentation should have a live demo of your tool uh, or the, the software, that app that you built. Um, documenting your code is going to be a big part of this, of course. Uh, and this also makes up 50% of your grade. This is, as you can see, the largest part of um, the, the overall grading that we have. 
Um, and then we get to the uh, written exam at the end of the semester, which will have questions about this initial lecture part, but also questions about the seminar topics, right? So that's another reason why you want to not just be there physically, like have your body sitting here, but also actually be paying attention to what's going on. Um, and there are, uh, these are the tentative dates. You may scribble these into your calendar now with your digital pencil, uh, but you know, they may change. Um, again, this is always a bit of a hassle with knowing how many numbers of people we actually have, et cetera. Um, but for sure, make sure you don't book any uh, you know, skiing vacation or any such thing. It's going to be a 60 minute exam and it's going to make up for 30% uh, of the grade. Yeah, that's a, that's a bug. They should say, say 30. All right, now, uh, as we said, uh, Renee, can you do a quick count of how many people we have here in the room? Just, just do a quick scan. Uh, uh, we have 42 seats available uh, on this class. Um, you need to be at the seminar. Um, you need to be in the project meetings uh, when we um, invite you to uh, appointments to give you one-on-one -on -one feedback on your, on your projects. Uh, so make sure that you can attend all these classes. You technically do not need to be in this room for the lecture, um, but I would recommend to do that because this is a great way to keep yourself engaged with the class and you know, think about the problems we bring up in class. Um, you know, maybe get asked a question or two, have your adrenaline come out of your ears. It's all part of the learning experience, right? So, um, and also much more fun than doing this online, let's say. So what's the numbers? Okay, so almost everybody will get a seat. Okay, that sounds good. Um, if you want to do us a huge favor, if you happen to be in this class and you decide, eh, not my thing, I like Android more or something, I don't know, uh, please do deregister from the class, okay? This will help everybody hugely to know that we can then let other people into this class. Because as you can see, it's going to be fast-paced, so while we love to get people on the waiting list and have them slide in if anybody drops out. If that happens after several weeks, it's just too tough for people to catch up. Right? So we want to make sure that we make use of all the seats that we have available for this class. So be nice and um, you know, uh, unroll, unenroll on, on AVTH online if you are not taking this class. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. They, they do. There's an, you, know, you do not have to be in this room to be eligible for this class. Yes, you're right. Um, so what we'll, I'll actually talk about how you get a seat in the class. Um, but our experience is, um, well, well, you're right, technically, our experience is usually that the people who engage with the class come to the first uh, session are usually the ones that also do the other things that we ask you know, people to do next. Um, and so uh, there's a likelihood that uh, this is going to work. But thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, how do you, how you do get a seat? Uh, you register in Arvich online, okay, um, and you send us the declaration of compliance, uh, which is a simple form that you need to read through, understand, and and sign and send back to us. Uh, you need to do that before tomorrow, uh, one o'clock. Um, again, quick show of hands: who has already sent in the declaration? Okay, a couple people. Good. Um, if you haven't, that's one thing that you should definitely do before tomorrow at noon. Uh, at one o'clock. Um, we will then invite everybody who did these two things um, to uh, Moodle to form groups. Okay? And then uh, we'll ask people in these groups to form groups of three students. Now, uh, there should be at least two students with a Mac per group. Not a hard requirement, but that's something you probably want to look for if you are balancing out your groups just to make things a little easier. Uh, you'll be probably doing some peer um, coding then, and that's totally fine. It's actually a pretty good ex experience to, to work and code with more than one person in front of the computer. Um, and what we'll do on Friday then at one o'clock is that we will uh, select 14 full groups from that list of, of people who did these steps. Uh, and then we'll take everybody out of the Moodle so we can see who is actually in the class. Um, does that make sense? Did I miss anything, Audio Renee? No? Okay. So those are the things that we'd ask you to do. And um, if you do them, 
then uh, that's basically maximizing your chances of, of signing up. We do have the experience that, you know, we have a lot of people signing up for a lot of classes, and if there's limited seating in a class, that tends to make people sign up even more because they're like, oh, I want to get into this, maybe I want to take this class, so let me sign up. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that we probably have a lot of um, you know, blind load at this point of people who ticked this but weren't really going to take the class. Um, okay, so um, where do you find stuff? Um, again, this is the jump page. Make a note of that if you, if you haven't already. Uh, this is where you will also find the slides and lecture videos, okay? So uh, this is the easiest way to, to get to these things. It will point you to the various resources that we have available. All right. Um, I think we can probably continue on in, directly with uh, our first stuff. That's all right? Okay. So we are now um, entering the actual class, okay? Uh, and uh, I would love to get an idea has anybody here already developed uh, apps on a phone before? Okay, that's about, no, oh, not bad, 10, 12 people. Can I ask, uh, what, what was the environment that you did that in? iOS and Android stuff. Okay, so you've done some, some things in this. Uh, same there? Android, okay, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, that's actually a great preparation if you know these things already. Things will you know, be, be easier that way. So. Um, if you've already done some iOS development, of course, um, you can take this class, absolutely. Uh, some of the um, you know, top results that we've seen in the class were from people who knew some iOS development already and used this to really round up their education on it and, and learn about all the frameworks. Um, Android also is a great preparation because quite a few things will be similar in the two platforms here. Now, um, uh, this is iOS, if you're wondering. Okay. Um, what I want to explain is that you know, there is a significant difference in writing apps for mobile versus desktop. And some of the things are obvious, uh, but I want to talk about the not so obvious difference here that people tend to forget. Uh, the easiest way to think about this is um, in a, uh, you know, on a desktop app, when you're writing a desktop app, it's pretty unlikely that your user while they're using your application, gets hit by a bus, right? Usually doesn't happen. This is not at all that unlikely if people are using a mobile app, okay? And I'm using this extreme example uh, to just point out that the context in which mobile applications get used is completely different from what people are doing at a desktop. At a desktop, you have focused, long-term engagement, you're writing code, you're writing your, you know, your seminar paper or whatever, you're researching stuff on the net and, and you're focused on this thing, this is kind of your world, everything else kind of, you know, you blend out um, and you have a high performance keyboard, you have a big screen, you're putting lots of documents next to each other, um, so you can do deep research, etc. And so it's basically, it tends to be your primary task, right, what you can do. You can make this your primary task and forget about everything else. If you're on your phone, a lot of the use that people have on their phone is quite different. It is, uh, you know, while I'm walking to the bus stop, let me quickly check when the next bus is coming. Or uh, while I am waiting for the bus to come, let me, you know, play a few rounds on this little game. Or let me quickly check my email inbox. Right? But you're not going to compose an application letter to the university of whatnot on your phone, right? Probably. Right? That's usually something you step back and say, that's a task that I'm going to um, sit down and use some kind of, you know, bigger screen and, and more comfortable uh, environment to focus on this task. So this environment is very different. Um, and I want to show you a short video that I think illustrates this point quite nicely. Uh, this was taken by a security camera in an office mall. Maybe you've seen that before, but I think it, it's a perfect illustration of what happens when people uh, use smartphones. Um, it kind of looks like this, I think. Is that playing? There we go. And there she's texting. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy goes out and all awkwardly walks away. Oh my god. Yeah, 
uh, what you're hearing there is the security guards who are watching that tape and having a blast, of course. Um, and he's like, play it again, play it again. Um, so very simple illustration of you know, the attention that a user has to a mobile app is fundamentally split between that app and their environment. And that's very different from what you do. I, I you, you can also think about it this way. You know, you're really uh, you're leaning forward into your device, and the rest sort of disappears when you are on a uh, on a productivity device like a like a laptop, for example, or a large tablet even. Um, and and you are more like disengaged with the device or half engaged with the device, but there's so much going on around it that it's also part of your attention when you are on a on a smartphone. Now, of course, you can do focused stuff on your smartphone, right? You can carefully compose a text message that you word very carefully, etc. or you can really get lost in a little uh, smartphone game. Um, but this other situation, this split attention situation, is something that is quite unusual to have on, on your desktop. And especially the context, being able to use it pretty much anywhere, um, is different. So that's the thing I want to drive home, because it's the not so obvious one from a technical point of view. Um, but it's an important difference in how you design your application, how you decide what functionality goes into your app and what doesn't go into your app, right? This is often the, the challenge. What are you not going to put into your mobile app uh, so that people can stay focused um, both on the app and the environment and they don't less get lost in the complexity of your application? There are a couple other characteristics that are different, and, and they are more mundane and obvious, right? The first one I already talked about, like the, so context is key with mobile applications, right? The, the task that you're working on, and this, by the way, that's true for you know, Android, iOS, um, just as well, right? Um, you know, the, the, the context is important to understand. You have split attention. You, people are using their phones uh, in a peripheral way. Maybe they put them down on the table and just look at them when a message comes in. Um, you have people moving about while they're using it. Again, something that's pretty unlikely on a, even on a laptop. Um, and the interaction times are short, right? They are often, many things are just getting used for a few seconds at a time. Um, then we have um, uh, limited resources from a hardware point of view, right? The screen size compared to a, uh, a desktop or even a laptop is, is very compact. So that means there is not enough space to show four or five documents next to each other overlapping themselves, right? You may have realized that um, you know, on a smartphone, you usually don't have an overlapping window arrangement, right? Because it doesn't make sense. Right? It's just not enough space. So typically, you interact, uh, users interact with one screen at a time. And that, again, is quite different from how you design an interaction in, in a desktop app. Um, also, mostly people are not just interacting with one screen of an app at a time. So the app has to move people through screens and make sure they don't get lost in between these screens. But also, they often basically only interact with one app at a time. If you've ever tried to uh, you know, copy and paste things back and forth between two apps on a smartphone versus on a desktop, you know what I'm talking about. Um, now, you can do uh, split screens, right? That's actually an interesting development of the last couple of years where large ta tablets have gotten larger and larger, um, like the iPad Pro is almost A4 or, or letter size. And, and then that's a big enough screen so that it starts making sense to have maybe two apps next to each other. And we're actually seeing a sort of almost like a window manager coming back now in the latest version of iPad OS, where you can actually have um, you know, multiple applications next to each other. But there are some other things that are noticeable, right? For example, on a desktop, I can put help in lots of places. I can provide um, tool tips or bubble help, you know, on, well, when I hover over something with a mouse, a little explanation can come up. Ever tried that on a smartphone? Yeah, it doesn't work, right? Because a smartphone as a touch device is missing one key interaction state. The state of my mouse pointer is over this thing, but I haven't clicked it yet. That just doesn't exist on a smartphone. Maybe something we don't think about, but once you do think about it, you realize there's one state missing, um, and that means that we are having trouble providing this contextual help that, that for example, tooltips do. Um, but there are also, of course, often help menus, you know, entries, and you've got a menu bar, you know, these kinds of things. You can show the commands that are available in the menu while dropping them down, or provide rows and rows of icons and buttons. You know, open up Word or anything right, on, on a desktop, and you see all these functionalities being laid out in front of you, and you can pick and choose. 
and it's easy to, you know, relatively easy to use because all the options are available to you to see. That's not true on a smartphone, right? At least you don't have the space to put all this up there. Otherwise, you've got rows and rows of buttons and then no place for the content anymore. Right? Um, when people started developing for mobile uh, many years ago, this was actually a frequent mistake that was made. They took the idea of how a desktop app works and they put in, you know, lots of tool buttons on the top of their screen and then you were left with like, you know, half an inch of where you could actually type something. Um, the direct touch input, I already mentioned that it's missing the, the hover state, but it also means that, of course, your, uh, your fingers are uh, bigger than, um, you know, your mouse pointer. And surprisingly, people can actually be very good at still hitting precise targets with the finger. That's something a colleague of ours, um, a researcher, actually figured out. That you can actually be, when you look at how people touch at stuff, they are very good at that. But your finger is still big, right? If you look at how small the screen is and how big your finger is, and you compare that to how much a mouse pointer covers on a normal display, it's a much, much worse situation. Right? So you're covering significant parts of the UI with your hand, with your palm, with your finger, uh, with your fingertip, and, and that means that it gets difficult to operate um, very fine-grained uh, user interfaces. So that means that you need to um, uh, redesign your um, your user interface components. Right, every single push button or toggle switch has to be redesigned to make sense in in this different environment to be operatable by a finger. Um, <clears throat> so, the situation that you will find yourself in is that maybe you're coming from a desktop app that exists and you're trying to write a mobile version of it, and then oftentimes you have to make this, you know, distinction, what am I going to cut off? What kind of things am I not going to put into the mobile version? Because the setting is different, right? Um, if you think about, um, I don't know, mail, for example, uh, yes, you're going to write mails on, on, your, on your mobile client, right? Uh, it's not great fun to type on a touchpad, but it works um, on a touchscreen. But you're probably not going to be doing major rearrangement and moving email, you know, messages back and forth between folders and accounts, etc. Right? So these kinds of things then um, are left out of the, of the interface. Now, uh, another quick show of hands here. Um, how many of you folks have actually taken Designing Interactive Systems 1? Okay, that's actually a few people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, eight people, nine, okay. Okay, uh, so how many are trying to take that in parallel now this semester? Okay, there's a, a bunch more people, good. Um, Designing Interactive Systems 1 is the, uh, is the fundamental class on HCI, on human computer interaction that we teach at our lab. Um, and it's the one where you learn how to build usable applications and how to basically do a good job um, in figuring out exactly what users really need rather than what you think they need uh, and how you then prototype these applications, how you build paper prototypes, uh, software prototypes, etc., and how you then work with users to figure out whether you are on the right track. Um, I highly recommend that class. Um, it's kind of, it's not a strong prerequisite for this, but uh, we will often ref refer back to uh, DIS1 when we say, and this is why you should do it this way with using this framework, or this is why the framework pays attention to, I don't know, low latency in the networking connections, because remember, you know, in DIS1 we said that we need to be below this threshold for a software to feel responsive, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, the, the quick sort of, you know, advertisement block here for DIS1 is um, uh, it's going to happen uh, on Wednesday mornings, um, 9.30 to 12. So if that is a time slot that you are still open, then uh, I'd recommend uh, checking out DIS1. It makes good, good sense to take it in parallel to this class. And it's the more fundamental class about usability and, and user experience. Something I personally think no computer science students should be without because otherwise you have lots of technical knowledge and you don't know how to use it to actually build useful things and to make stuff that, you know, brings humanity forward. Um, but 
so it's a class that I would recommend you guys have a look at. Uh, Designing Interactive Systems, it's called, and starts tomorrow at 9.30. Also has limited seating, but not quite as uh, uh, limited as here, because here the uh, things we need to do with the seminar talks and stuff and the project uh, coaching is more intense. So I'm mentioning this because uh, Designing Interactive Systems 1 also is one of the classes where we have a whole section where we talk about golden rules of interface design, right? Um, and I'm just reiterating these here, this pulled out of the, the DIS1 class set um, to, to explain what these are about. Um, and let me just go through these here. They're pretty obvious if you read them, but some of them are actually more intricate if you, if you start learning about what they mean. Um, keeping the interface as simple as possible uh, means that you want to basically adjust yourself to what the user is actually um, needing in this particular situation. Right? And that, of course, applies to mobile environments maybe even more than the desktop. Speaking the user's language means that, um, you know, you don't do what, what they did in RDPH Online where, you know, a class is called an equivalency node when we are configuring classes, but, you know, a class is a class, right? So don't use technical jargon in your user interface. Use the words and concepts and language and, uh, and principles from the domain that your application is about. So um, a software that's support, supposed to support people managing classes should have the concept of a class called like that and also uh, be handled like a class in its user interface. Consistency and predictability is a big one um, that basically says, um, I want to be able to know that similar things that I do in the interface will have similar effects no matter what app, right? And that's one that you maybe have noticed already um, either going from Android to iOS, then you certainly notice that there's gonna be inconsistencies, things work differently, but even sometimes within the same environment, right? Um, I'm seeing a list of items. How do I delete an item? Maybe it's the swipe from right to left, you know? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, right? So these things are um, should be consistent if you do a good job in your UI. And predictability uh, comes with that, right? If, if something is consistent, then I can start predicting what it's gonna be doing in a particular situation. Providing feedback um, means that the user should, oh, thank you, uh, that the user should always know what is gonna happen next, right? And why uh, a certain action has certain consequences. So if I delete an item in a list, I wanna see that the item got deleted, right? I need to know about this. And this is also trickier on mobile than on the desktop because on mobile, the challenge is you, got, you don't have much space, right? You don't have a status bar or something like this available where you can do these things. Um, minimizing memory, memory load refers to the fact that you don't want to overload people having to remember things. And that's actually one that I think is a, a major issue in mobile platforms. Um, why? Because of gestures. If you think about how a gesture works, for example, the one where you swipe from right to left to delete an item, right, in the list, um, if you don't know about that one, how are you gonna find out? You, know, you, you literally need to go and look online and read like a manual for this app to learn about this because it's not visible anywhere. It's not indicated anywhere in the interface. Um, that's very different from having a delete button, right? If the delete button is there, I can see it. It's, it's, you know, it's good visibility. I press it, I do the deletion, done. But if gestures are not actively taught in the user interface somehow, then users have very little ways of figuring them out. And to this day, I couldn't tell you all the gestures that are possible on my smartphone, like my iPhone and various applications, because if you don't use them all the time, you just don't remember. Avoiding errors, or if people make mistakes, then helping them to recover and, and offer an undo functionality um, is also, of course, something that is um, important in the user interface, but how do you, again, how do you do undo? Anybody seen a, a way of doing undo on, a, on, on iPhones? Yeah? Shake to undo, right, yeah. Kind of, sort of, sometimes, or often, right? But it has all kinds of issues. First of all, it's invisible, right? N nothing in the interface is telling me that that works. There's no visible indication that that's available. Secondly, I've walked down the street often enough having typed half a message, and then it says, did you really want to, you know, undo all your typing? I'm like, no! <laughs> uh, because, you know, the walking was mis you know, mistakenly interpreted as shaking. So 
these things have issues, right? Um, and so it's hard on mobile devices to fulfill these rules. Um, designing clear exits and closed dialogues is also a, a wonderful example. Uh, if you re remember, the first um, iPhones had a little round home button, right? And you, you press that button, and it would always take you back to the home screen. Wonderful design, right? Really simple. Like my mom would understand, right? Um, and then came multitasking. And then the home button, you know, you could double tap the home button and it would, you know, open up this thing. Uh, and then you could like triple click it and it would activate, I don't know, accessibility settings or something. And then it became a, uh, an ID reader, which is nice on the one hand, but it also meant that it now had another function. And then it was removed altogether because it's a physical button and for some reason those need to go. So now you've got an invisible gesture, which is like swiping up from the very edge of your screen, which you can get used to if you know it and you need it often enough that you will remember. But, you know, the physical button isn't there anymore. And I don't know about you guys, but I do tend to pick up my phone the wrong way around more often than I used to with the phone says still had a physical home button. Right? Um, so you're losing some, you know, actual physical affordances, physical um, features of the device that are, uh, that, that used to be quite useful. So, um, you know, this is what rule number seven refers to, clear exits, always knowing how to get back to a safe space is one, uh, safe point, that's an important one. Help and documentation, we already talked about that that's hard on a, on a small smartphone, um, and offering shortcuts for experts. What I mean by that is that on, on a desktop app, for example, you may get keyboard shortcuts, right? You can, can hit Control X on Windows to, to cut instead of, you know, picking the menu item. Um, doesn't really exist. The shortcuts for experts on smartphones tend to be gestures. So they are there, but again, they're invisible and you have to discover them. One of the last recommendations is, you know, not to try to design all of the user interface yourself if you're not a graphics designer, but actually hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, that I think applies to mobile apps equally as to desktop. Well, maybe even more so. I tend to feel that people are you know, since mobile apps tend to not be that expensive, they tend to go in and try them out. Uh, but if they don't really shine and look polished and look kind of, you know, hacked together, they are very quickly discarded. Right? Oh, it was just, you know, two euros, I'm not going to bother anymore. Uh, so, also, m many mobile apps are actually doing surprisingly simple things, if you think about it, right? Uh, so, more and more of the value of the app goes into how smoothly it makes that simple thing possible for the user. So graphic design, probably more important on mobile apps than on the desktop, where you often have software that somebody needs to use for their work, so they will you know, deal with the less than stellar user interface and the less than ideal polish that it received. Let's briefly talk about uh, the, the family of devices we're, we're looking at here. Um, uh, this is what you have sort of today, right? You've got tablet size, you've got large, uh, large uh, iPhones, you've got um, regular size iPhones, you've got Apple Watches. Of course, we also have Apple TV for, again, very different user experience and, and uh, differently designed UI. Um, uh, the, the iPhone, when it was introduced in 2007, um, sort of just took the, the, the smartphone market by storm, right? It just basically destroyed the not smartphone market. Um, and uh, the big decision there that I think that we saw already in the first iPhones, even though they still had a home button, was uh, to resolve a major conflict of user interfaces, right? It used to be that you had to decide more space for the buttons or more space for the screen. So you ended up with like tiny, 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 tiny buttons, like in a Blackberry or something, and a kind of too small screen to do anything useful. Um, and the, the bold decision here with the iPhone was to say, well, we're just gonna not do a keyboard which of course is a major hassle if you ever tried typing without looking on a touch screen, not good, right? So that's definitely uh, worse in usability even than a tiny keyboard. But the screen of course means that I can now basically design the entire UI from top to bottom of the device to fully fit the task at hand. And that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes I want to just watch a movie and I use the whole screen for just, you know, you know consuming content and other times I need a large keyboard so I can bring that up and type on it. Um, the, uh, how does it feel to be an app? iOS is an app-centric development, which means you have one app per task, 
Um, so as a developer, you have to def really define what that task is supposed to be that users should be accomplishing with your app. Um, you know, you want to rather try to do one thing, but do that really well. Right? Um, data is also much more stored per app than it is on the desktop. Right? On your desktop, you know, you get your folders that you go through, and, and you're used to maybe working in a document-centric environment where you, you know, documents come first, and then you open them with some app to process them. Um, in the first years of iOS, you couldn't even exchange data you know, between apps. There wasn't even a copy and paste way. Um, and uh, for a long time, there was no file system available in iOS that the user could see. Right? You have to jump through lots of hoops, getting data out of one app and getting it into another app. This has changed, so these things have sort of moved closer together again, but it is still difficult between some apps to exchange data. Um, so that's something that we need to be aware of. That is also a major difference, I think, in designing for mobile. Uh, when, you, when you design your UI, and these are going to be some general things about iOS uh, user interface design, following the general design guidelines, um, you have to make sure that you, it's very obvious how to use your application. Why? Limited attention, short interactions, very rarely using applications. I mean, I've got hundreds of apps on my phone, um, so how often do I get to use any single one of them, right? Um, there is a useful uh, design pattern to sort information from top to bottom, meaning the most important stuff goes at the top. So you can see here the stopwatch has its you know, actually you know, elapsed time at the top. That's the most important thing to look at. Um, visual weight, meaning you know, large, small, et cetera, uh, is used to, to indicate importance. And we are seeing also alignment for groupings or hierarchy here, right? So things are being uh, put into a box here, like these three lap times are group because they look similar, uh, they use similar sort of color stripes going across. Um, and uh, at the very bottom we've got, uh, or, or here we have in, in a convenient area to reach for the thumb uh, for one-handed use, we've got the start and uh, reset buttons, stuff like this, and then of course the tab bar at the, at the very bottom to switch to other things. So that uses, you know, the, you know that makes it possible to divide your app up into subparts functionally. Um, so you, you cannot really assume that people take the time or attention uh, to figure out a complex looking app. Right? That's not going to be happening. So the immediate function needs to be available and obvious immediately. So you've got to reduce the number of controls you provide. Um, and you have to make sure that people um, you know, have large items that catch their eye, that make them immediately you know, get drawn to them. Um, here's an example of um, how you deal with more complex content in mobile apps. Again, you know this from a, uh, from a user, but we've got, we, we launched the Node apps, uh, we get an overview of a list of items, we drill down into a single item then, right? And then inside the single item, we actually have a separate mode for actually editing and changing that item using the keyboard. Once we're done with that, the keyboard disappears again, gives us more content in the detail view, and we get back to the list view, where we can then do, for example, the right uh, to left swipe gesture to delete something. Right? That's a typical interface where you've already seen one, two, and you could say two and a half different screens uh, for handling the content because the space is so limited. You don't see the list of notes and your note that you're editing at the same time on, a, on his phone because the space isn't there. Um, you gotta make sure that your text is legible, of course, you know, size-wise, right? You have to avoid inconsistent appearances, um, provide targets that are about fingertip size. So eight by eight millimeters is a good rule of thumb um, to start with. And in general, because typing on a touch screen kind of sucks, um, you want to minimize text input. Right? You don't want people to have to type in a lot of text if that is um, possible to avoid. Right? Um, the calculator shows this nicely. Um, um, how this is being done here, um, looking very much uh, like an application that you would um, immediately recognize. The one-handed use of smartphones is probably something that caught even Apple by surprise, I would, I would think, because it's something that everybody is doing now, right? Um, but it's something that is actually not ideal to do on a smartphone. For example, um, since if you use a smartphone with one hand, there are lots of areas that you cannot reach confidently, right, with your thumb. And 
phones have dealt with this differently. As they got bigger, this became more and more of an issue, and now you've got ways to pull down, for example, the top half of the screen on iOS to, to address that and if you don't have your second hand available. Also, multi-touch is something that even today, you know, I'm not saying single touch, right? That's something everybody is very con con comfortable with, but multi-touch is something that is, e even today, is a little weird, and people are not readily going to be trying to explore it. So only use it in your interface if you actually need it for the application, if it makes sense. Um, Apple provides a couple of examples uh, of standard gestures throughout the UI that you should be using. Use those if possible. Don't make up your own um, you know, dialect of a multi-touch language um, because it will just confuse the heck out of people. Uh, and if you do need complex uh, gestures, uh, if there is like a three-finger twirl for some specific act interaction, then you do need to provide help for, to the user by showing that, uh, you know, giving them a little video of how that works, stuff like that. Um, any gestures with three fingers or more are really difficult for, you know, for a lot of people to do. Uh, here's a list that, that Apple provides of, of standard gestures. Um, and you know all these gestures, but maybe you haven't thought about that they actually make up a vocabulary and that they have different meanings, right? So for example, tapping is obviously uh, to, to press a button, like what's called a control usually, um, or to select an item, right? Just like to select uh, an image in a collection of images that you may want to share. Um, it's, it's analogous to the single mouse click. Then you've got the, um, uh, the dragging gesture, that you know, is used to scroll through content or to pan uh, across a larger image. Um, and you've got the flicking gesture to do the same thing more quickly. Now, here's a quick question for the technically minded. Um, how do you, from an algorithmic point of view, what, what are you, you going to do? How are you going to code the difference between dragging and flicking if you need to write that gesture? What's the difference between those two? Yeah. Precisely, right? The, if I if my gesture speed at the end is zero, like I move and then I let go, then it's a drag. If I keep going and I still have velocity when I lift up, then it's a flick. So these are the kinds of things that you need to look at. Um, again, something that we haven't really had to do um, um, when we were uh, writing applications for, for like mouse-based interfaces. Um, swiping, on the other hand, um, for example, in table view, uh, reveals the delete button, right? If you do a swipe, then you know, that's supposed to show the reveal button. How do you differentiate between a swipe and a drag? Uh, that you could do the border, but actually there is no difference. There is no difference from a gesture recognition, at least not in iOS, how it's doing it. Uh, it depends on context, right? If it's happening on a table view role, it means the swipe gesture, you know, revealing the delete function, for example. If it's somewhere else, for example, in the middle of a big picture that I'm looking at a photo, then it's going to be doing pen. Uh, but yeah, there are ed edge, sort of uh, screen edge gestures that are then again their own thing that you can use to, to distinguish. Uh, double tapping to zoom in and, and uh, center something and also to zoom out. And that was a, a, a source of confusion early on because Google Maps used you know, two finger tap to zoom out. Everybody else on the iPhone was using single, double tap with a single finger to zoom out. There you are, you know, users were confused. Um, and that was because Google was just using the same interface that they knew from their other, um, from their other apps. Uh, pinching open and close to zoom in and out, that has become actually surprisingly um, useful because it's also a very physical mapping and touching and holding uh, for editable text to um, zoom in and see a cursor to, to move around. So um, the resolutions uh, that we are dealing with are much more manageable than in the Android world because we only have a, a reasonable number of different devices but they are still different sizes. Right? Um, the way that this is handled uh, by Apple you will see in the, in the iOS um, uh, user interface toolkits, they really only differentiate a, a more compact and a, and a larger size in each of the horizontal and vertical directions. And that's how layout decisions get made. So, um, and that changes between whether you have a small phone or a medium phone or, or, or a tablet, for example. Of course, we also have device orientation changing. 
Um, and that is something, an early recommendation by Apple was to say, device orientation should never be something that you use in your app to change functionality. It should always be a choice of the user, whether they want to hold it that way or want to hold it that way. Um, but if you design for the iPad, it means more than just increasing resolution, right? Just putting more there. You can't just scale up your interface and be done with it. Um, the iPad is, again, a different device from the iPhone, and it is a different use case. It's one where I'm consuming content in a relaxed fashion. I'm not probably going to walk around with an iPad Pro in my hand, um, you know, on the way to the bus stop trying to check my mail. So it probably is not happening. So it's, again, a different device that needs to be thought through. Here's an example of, um, you know, just to, to remind you guys how applications change, right? Desktop mail, um, mobile mail. You know, this thing falls apart into multiple screens that you move back and forth from. Uh, and then if you look at how it works on the iPad in landscape mode, you've got this, like, um, in-between solution, right? Content and one level of hierarchy, but not all the levels from the desktop app. And if you move it actually to uh, um, portrait mode, then you end up having that uh, thing there as an overlay that covers your con detail content and that you can move out of the way. Right? So it's only temporary. These are all ways to deal with the different uh, available spaces that we, that we have. Another thing that is quite different is how apps start and end. Because you remember from your desktop, right, you would fire up an app and use it, and then when you're done with it, or when you shut down your computer or whatever, log out, you close it, right? Um, you quit it, literally. And, and we're never quitting apps on a smartphone. The user is not supposed to be doing that. And that confused no end, you know, confused developers no end in the beginning. They're like, wait, 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 where do I put my quit button, right? Where does that go? It doesn't exist, right? The thing that happens is your app starts and then it, it sits there uh, until it's moved to the background and then ultimately maybe it gets purged because of memory shortage. Uh, but it's a very different life as an application. When you do launch, also, um, one thing that to this day, um, some developers are still making that mistake. They put splash screens in their apps, right? And splash screens are like a complete no-go in a mobile environment. Uh, on, on a desktop app, you do this because you know people start this app once and then they use it for hours, right? So it's okay to put a splash screen in there to say this is whatever, the latest um, cool application by so-and-so. Um, but if you do that in an app that's being used on a mobile, let's you know, just pull it out, look at it, put it back, uh, that would be very annoying. Plus, apps really only launch very occasionally, and then they, you know, the user doesn't know, is this application actually coming back from the background, or am I launching it fresh, right? They may not even be aware of the difference here. Um, so instead, what you're supposed to be doing is showing a launch image that closely resembles the first screen of your app. That's actually, that's actually a file, right? That's actually a file, a picture, a pixel image that you are supposed to put up um, you know, that, that already lays out the user interface a little bit like what's going to come, right? So you can see here, this is sort of the launch image already having this little Yahoo button and this little button down here. And then it gets filled in with the content that comes in. You are supposed to be restoring the state of the last run, right? So it's really a, a wake up um, much more than a, 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 a launching. Um, if there is a requirement to log in, you are supposed to delay that as long as possible. A lot of applications don't do this, but they should. Um, again, that's because logging in may require text input, which is tedious, or may require some other kind of uh, identification like face ID, touch ID, uh, which is also a hurdle. And if it's not necessary, just to look up you know, current um, uh, scores on, like, uh, on, on, on the market, I don't need to uh, log into anything. It shouldn't be necessary. Um, by default, the application should launch in the current orientation. Sometimes you see apps that don't do that, and then they come up, and then they open up, and they immediately turn. That's not nice. Um, and if you do want to provide what's called an onboarding experience, then you need to think twice about this. Onboarding means, you know, you launch an app, and it starts explaining to you how it works. It gives you a little tutorial, and this is what you need to press here, and this is what you And uh, you've all been in this situation as users, right? They are like, oh, I just want to use this app. Go away, right? So nobody reads them the first time, and then later on, when they should know what was taught, talked about in the, in the onboarding, they don't know that stuff. But the developer kind of assumes they know because the developer wrongly assumes that everybody looks at the onboarding experience. Well, they don't. Onboarding experiences are the new user manual, basically. You know, neither actually gets looked at. Um,
It's also interesting if you take the App Store as an example. Right? You can actually browse through the App Store, and, and you don't need to log in until you actually decide to buy something. Right? It lets you browse the apps, because that makes, that, that makes sense. Right? Um, all right, now stopping, as I said, no quit buttons, no quit menu item, doesn't exist. Um, you have to be ready in your application to be moved to the background and therefore also ultimately be terminated at pretty much any time. Um, for example, um, you know, it might also happen that your app is running and in the middle of that a phone call comes in, which then gets overlaid over your application, right? So at that point your application needs to be able to seize operations, move to the background, wait until its, its turn comes back. Um, whenever you get stopped that way, you should definitely make sure that you store your state, right, the current program state, um, because when you get moved to, back, to the background and you don't have your state stored, at some point your application may just get shut down. Um, and then if the user brings it back later on and they lost the state that they did, like typing a half-finished message, it's very annoying. I fall for this even today. Have you guys ever done this? You take a picture, you copy it out of your photo library, you say, you know, share via, I don't know, mail or something. Then you start typing up a mail about that image. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. I wanted to say that we meet tomorrow at when? You move over to your calendar. When you come back to mail, this whole thing is gone. That has happened to me. That's terribly annoying. That's destroying the user's work, something we should never, ever do. Uh, lots of these you know, pieces of wisdom come out of uh, DIS1, by the way, if you, if you attend that class. All right. Um, and uh, when, you, when you have anything that uh, is not possible, any features that you cannot use, then you need to inform the user why that's the case and how to fix that, right? For example, um, you know, th this app is not, you know, if it needs your location, and if you want to do that, you need to go into setting and do that. Um, so uh, I want to uh, wrap this up with a couple of different um, application styles. These are interesting to understand because they will give you a first chance of knowing how should I be designing my application. There are three fundamental styles. Productivity, like the Photos app, for example, here. Uh, then there are utility applications, like the Weather app, and uh, immersive apps, like this, this is a, a, a view of, of you know, the, the, the world at night, a Sea Dragon uh, browser application. Um, let's look at productivity first. Productivity applications are there to organize and manage detailed information. Right? It could be this collection of photos, or your mail, or uh, anything like that. Uh, they often do organize data hierarchically, like the Notes app is another example. Right? You've got this drill down interaction where you drill down into a detailed view, you do stuff there, you, drill back, you go back out. Um, you need to be able to organize the list of items that is available in these typical productivity apps. You need to be able to add or remove items, like deleting rows in a, in a, in a, in a list, for example. Uh, contacts will be another one of these applications. These applications are very focused on the task, and their user interface is usually pretty boring. Right? It's pretty simple. It uses the standard controls from iOS. The buttons always look the same. Maybe they are colored in the style of the app, that's, but that's pretty much it. Um, and any advanced settings of this app are likely done in the settings app, right? outside the application itself. Another quirk of iOS that is quite unusual for, for people from other platforms. Um, so here are some examples, right? Next to Photos, you've got the Contacts app um, or the Reminders list. All of these work the same way, right? You drill down into your item, you work with it, you do stuff to it, and you go back out into your hierarchy views. The next one is Utility apps. They have a very, very simple task, much less complex than Productivity. Uh, they only use very little user input, um, and their, their UI is there for geared to being visually attractive and easy and smooth for exactly that one purpose that they have. Um, you often, in these apps, have data flattened in the list of items. What are some examples? The weather app or the stocks app. Right? They are not as complex as managing your mail, for example, or even managing your contacts or your reminders, um, but they still have a bit of information display to do. And as you can see, um, you know, the weather app looks very different in its visual appearance from the, the, the Stocks app, for example, because they are both trying to really, they know exactly this is my domain, right? This is what I'm doing. Um, and they can gear the user interface towards it and make it 
um, a bit more fun to explore, a bit more visually rich, less standard user interface components, more things getting towards custom UI um, building for the application domain. Um, oftentimes we see the, the, the page uh, controller here to navigate between different views in these things. Um, and um, this is an application, by the way, that lets you do nothing else than explore the table of the elements, you know, the chemical table of the elements, but with gorgeous graphics of, of each element and lots of information and visually very nicely done. Um, and so this is actually, you could say, a utility application. It's almost always already crossing over to the third kind, the immersive applications. Immersive applications, best example, games, but also quite a few others, have a full screen user interface, visually very rich. They focus on the content and the user experience in that moment. They tend to hide a lot of the UI. They tend to remove user interface components from the UI to let people really focus on the content. Um, and their navigation and, and general interaction methods are often quite, quite customized, right? They're quite unusual. Um, some examples um, that I'm gonna show you are like the Living Earth or the Carpenter app. Um, you know, they, they definitely um, try to really uh, get into the application domain and be sort of an in enjoyable little task. Um, these things um, usually you know, are there to have fun, whether you're playing a game or viewing media-rich content or maybe just performing a simple task, right? So, um, games are of course the best representative of this class. And as you can see, there are no standard user interface components anywhere in these, in these applications, right? We don't use standard UI buttons here because everything fades away and goes into the background and the, the content, the experience is, is right up there in the, in the front. So we've got uh, productivity, we've got utility, and we've got immersive applications. This is a very, very rough first compass for you if you're designing an application. Again, that's true for Android just as well as for, for iOS. Um, when you're designing an application to decide which way does my application actually need to go? What, what, what is my ultimate goal? Productivity, I'm gonna be using a lot of the standard UI kit stuff. I'm gonna create a fairly complex UI, lots of drill down views, uh, tabs and, and button rows maybe at the top for different things or at the bottom for different actions that people need to do. I'm gonna have gestures to act on individual items, et cetera. But it's gonna hopefully be something that if anybody has ever used another app on, on iOS of that sort, like if they know how to use mail, they should know how to use your productivity app, right? You should be using the same fundamental user interface components and gestures. If you're on the other hand going for utility or even immersive apps, then these constraints tend to get loosened and you are really trying to just be about the specific application domain. In mail, there is no application domain. It could be mails about anything. It could be mail about you know, your theater group or, or a building construction, we don't know, right? So that's why these things stay fairly neutral and, and, and objective in, in their design. All right, let's wrap up. Um, you've learned a couple things today, hopefully. First thing is that we've uh, started explaining what is the difference between mobile and desktop apps and designing for these two environments. Um, you should have seen that um, not just understanding what the user wants, but also what that task is, is quite different usually in, in mobile apps. And the context, right, where they are is actually um, a prime differentiating feature of mobile apps. You need to, of course, keep that in mind when you're designing for mobile, right? What is the context? How much attention do I actually have? How do I make sure that the user gets along with my app even though I don't expect them to fully, you know, read the manual and spend time with the onboarding experience and only ever use my app when they're in like a dark room with no distractions? That's not realistic, right? So uh, design for the real world use of your app and keep also, of course, the hardware restrictions in mind that we have, right? Battery life and screen size and typing sucks and all these kinds of things. Um, understand these three application styles and think about where uh, your application falls. And um, we do have, there is more reading uh, material available that you can take a look at. One is the iOS human interface guidelines, which are actually quite uh, revealing to read because they do tell you a lot about not just iOS specific, but in general, how mobile apps should be structured to be easy to use. Uh, and then there is an, an entry level 
uh, thing under everyone can code that is also fun to look at. Um, so for you guys, what you need to do next is, of course, if you haven't already, register in RWH online. If you haven't already, do sign the declaration of compliance and send it to Renee and Oli um, at these email addresses. Do that by tomorrow, 1 p.m. Like, as we said, that's going to be our uh, cutoff date for getting people to be um, considered for this class. Then the next lecture is going to be happening next Monday. So we are doing a two lectures a week format right now. Um, and uh, what we will do there is we will talk about the seminar topics a little more. You'll hear a bit more about what these are about. Um, and we will begin with our introduction into the Swift programming language. As always, the one thing to remember is our landing page, hci.rvjahn.de uh, slash iOS. That's where you'll find everything there. Thanks for listening, and thanks for coming to class today. Have a great rest of your week. This content was provided by RWTH Aachen University.